since requesting their clients and knowing that there's always questions being asked and information being needed. But it also comes to you with the help and support of our educational partners who are here. So because of them, it's their support that helps to make this possible uh, and make it free. So just uh, going along, uh, the, just at the, part, at the table on the side, we have Jeanette Bach, she's with Fluid Senior Transitions, Denise LeBlanc from Harvard Memorial, Irene Zoba from 360 Downsizing, Mila White, uh, Blue Wing Group, um, Blue Wing Advisory Group, Randy James. Beside her, oh, there was Sarah, but she's Sarah's given up her seat to somebody else, Sarah Sonnex from Smith's Funeral Homes, and Sarah's up in all And uh, Rob Hamilton, who's new with us this season uh, from uh, Hearing Well Matters. So thanks, Rob, for joining us. I uh, also just want to acknowledge the people who helped to get us here to, so far. Uh, we have Lisa Bilodeau at the back, and Mia Gabuza, she's still doing stuff here, trying to, be, trying to keep us on board, but without them, we wouldn't be able to meet this event. Uh, also, not here today is Paul Cutajar, it's with Senior Care Access. They've also been a great support. Uh, the information about our educational partners is on the handouts that you have, so there's their the nature of their business contact information, and they're here for the taking, so if you have an opportunity, but if you haven't yet, on your way out, please sure. Okay, <laughs> I'll get out of here. Very distracting. Uh, please be sure to stop and talk to them. Nobody bites, no one's gonna sell you anything, but they do have a wealth of knowledge information, and they're gonna be a great resource for you when the time comes that you need somebody like that. I appreciate it if you just give them some thought. Before we get started, I'm just going to ask that you please turn off your phones. Um, disruptions. We have a busy afternoon, lots to get through. Our plan is to wrap up at 3 o'clock, by 3 o'clock. Uh, we have a large group today, so um, there'll be lots of questions and lots of discussion. We hope we will have, uh, make sure that we have time to answer your questions. Uh, use the notepads that you've got, please, and you've got a pen and a notepad. Just dot down your questions. Uh, jot down your questions and we will address them uh, at the end of the time. Uh, we'll have a general Q&A at the end. And if you are asking a question, please do speak up so that everybody can hear. We don't want any kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations. So today's session. Today's session clearly is something of interest to many. And it's about our health care system and more specifically how to navigate health um, home and long-term care. We have three incredibly capable professionals here today with us and they'll help us understand the ins and the outs and also the realities of the system. So first off we'll be hearing from Alyssa Oliver. Alyssa is the Director of Private Care and Customer Support at Acclaim Health. She's been in RPN since 2008 and has worked in several different roles with home care systems, both publicly funded and privately funded. Alyssa understands the home care system can be confusing and that's why she's here today, to help people understand how the system works, what's available and how to access it. In terms of her personal life, she has two children, a four and a one-year-old, she's a busy girl, and is very familiar, family-oriented, and enjoys spending time doing family activities, whether it's going out family outing, camping, playing outside, or going for family walks with your dog. We have Sandra Anderchuk, who is um, a bachelor of, um, bachelor, of nursing, bachelor of Science in Nursing, Master of Science, and MH. Master of Science. Lots of stuff. She's focused a large portion of her professional career on health, wellness, and caring for those who've been impacted by illness. She holds a master's degree in science and nursing from McMaster and a master's degree in health science and bioethics from the University of Toronto. She's had extensive career in health care, serving 16 years as a pediatric nurse practitioner and over 10 years in health care as a health care ethicist. Her career has largely focused on supporting patients, families, and the community with end-of-life care planning educating and supporting healthcare professionals on caring with compassion for the body patient and assisting clients to navigate the moral, ethical, legal, and technical landscape within the Ontario Public Health System. And she offers community education on advanced care planning, aging well, and death and dying. 
She founded in 2020 Quality Life Planning, a healthcare consultation service that focuses on end of life planning, advocacy, system navigation, community and health professional education, and advanced healthcare directories. Sandra has also brought this service to Cambridge Law for an opportunity for clients that's unique in the state planning industry. And as well, oh, so she's Jack of all trades, a yoga instructor, and providing senior yoga classes for Indian and Health Food and Wellness. Monday morning at the library in Waterdown. <laughs> <laughs> and Jerry, born in Mauritius, a proud University of New Brunswick alumni. He has a wife, a wife and son, and they now live in Burlington for the past 12 years. After 20 years sitting in front of a computer, Jerry wanted to do something more meaningful, and when a home care opportunity presented, he knew it was the right one. So 10 years later, he's helped thousands of people find the right solution for home care through quality care building, whether in their own home or finding the right retirement home in the community. He's been ever grateful since and continues to make home care accessible for everyone. So you're in good hands today. As I said, if you have questions, jot them down, note them, and we will make sure we don't have anybody go home with anything for me. Um, and we'll get started. Well, let's If I'm not loud enough, feel free to just shout at me. All right, I do see some familiar faces, and thank you very much for the introduction, so we can save some time on me talking about myself. Um, today, we, I'm going to talk a little bit about navigating the home care system. Uh, the presentation is somewhat in three parts. The bulk of it is how to access home and community care services, uh, what's available, how to get those, who to call, that kind of thing. Uh, and then I will talk a little bit about retirement and long-term care, mainly focusing on what the difference is between the two and how to access those two. Uh, because getting into them is a very different process and I know there is a lot of confusion surrounding um, just a lot of people will say a senior's home. Well, there's different types and what's available and all of those. Uh, however, with the time constraints, I will focus mostly on the home care system. Okay, so the first thing I always tell people is it's never too early to plan. So create what you want your healthcare to look like and what the future of that looks like um, and put those plans into place. Always have a plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G <laughs> uh, because things are always changing. So uh, what's available may change, your situation may change and a lot of people have a hard time planning what they can't predict and what that's going to look like. Um, which is why we have lots of advanced care planners here today <laughs> uh, who can help you through that process. So involving someone who knows the system is really important, uh, but involve your family and your physician as well. Uh, so a lot of times when people are putting these plans into action, um, they are not able to communicate their wishes to people. So it's often other people around you that are sort of putting them in, getting those wheels moving and putting them into motion. So communicating that with your loved ones uh, is extremely important on what uh, is ideal for you. When you are making those decisions and creating those plans, some key things to think about would be your finances, uh, your current living arrangement, what is the physical environment? Uh, are you someone who wants to stay in your home forever, however you only have, a, it, it, there's five flights of stairs to get to the first toilet? Uh, is your bedroom upstairs? Uh, is it a huge property that you're gonna have to maintain yard work? So all of that is something to think about. What is your current uh, physical environment? And what is your support system? Uh, do you have family? Do you have friends? Um, do you have people around you that can help in a pinch? Um, and your health. So someone who is in fantastic physical health, I was talking earlier, I think about the lady who is 99 and extremely good shape, uh, versus are you younger and starting to have some physical ailments? So those are things you want to consider because your options may change depending on all of those. And we do say finances because I, although I'm going to go through a lot of uh, free services or publicly funded services, 
Um, one thing, although the healthcare system is confusing, I think we can all agree that it's not perfect and there is not um, a ton available uh, through the publicly funded system. So always making sure you're planning financially for that as well. Okay, so to start off with home and community care. Uh, so when I talk about home and community care, uh, currently that's what we call HCCSS. However, they used to be called the LIN, they used to be called CCAC. So they change their name every once in a while to keep us on our toes, but it's all the same thing. Uh, so some of you still may call them the LIN, sometimes I do as well, so either way it's the same, the same thing. A lot of people ask, well, who's paying for this? Where's all the money coming from? And why can't I access this program and this program? So this is just a little schematic on where that money comes from and to keep it super short and sweet, it can be very lengthy. Money starts with the Ministry of Health and heads over to Physicians and Specialty Services and then the other piece goes to the Ontario Health Regions, Lynn's, CCC, and then it divides up between hospital and long-term care and then home and community care support services and community support services. The main takeaway from this is that you cannot double dip into the funding. So if you are accessing, let's say you have a PSW that comes to your house every day through home and community care, and you adore her and she's fantastic, and then you move to long-term care, or you end up in the hospital, and you want her to continue helping you, she can't. So she can, but privately. She can't come through this funding into that funding. Uh, so it's sort of double dipping. That's sort of the key takeaway of that. Okay, so home and community care support services, uh, also known as home care. In order to access this, it does require an assessment from a care coordinator. Uh, they will determine what services you qualify for, and typically those services include your nursing, PSW, physio, occupational therapy, social work, speech, language, dietitians. Uh, so really, your physical needs, uh, those people will come into your home or you would go to a clinic to get those services. In order to access that, you can refer yourself. A family member can call, your physician can call for you. Uh, for the most part, I know it sounds much more simple than it is, it's just a phone call away. Um, but it, you do sometimes go through hoops and I completely understand that. So the care coordinator would be a registered professional that would come out to assess you. Uh, so there's a lengthy criteria and they determine what you get. So they may say, you know what, we can um, send a PSW to see you twice a week uh, for the following tasks. Uh, and a nurse will come out once a week to tend to your wound or you go to a clinic. So they sort of determine what services you're eligible for and then they send that out to service providers to actually provide the care. So they would send referrals to different agencies uh, in that geographical area to say, we have a client, they live in this postal code, here's what they need, the frequency of the service, can you do it? We then say yes or no, uh, and then actually provide that care. And then home and community care provides the funding and ultimately determines what you get. So when your PSW or your nurse comes to your home and you say, you know what, can you come a little bit more often? Uh, they've got to check with the big guys to see if that's a possibility. So they determine the frequencies, not the service provider and not the staff actually servicing you. Um, that being said, and I've had this conversation with many people already today, resources are very limited. Uh, so we are in a, we are in a spot right now in the healthcare system where even if a care coordinator were to go out and say, you qualify for a PSW three times a day, and uh, that's great, that's fantastic. Um, but finding an agency that physically has a PSW to come out three times a day may present another challenge. Uh, so then the agencies go back and say, you know, I could do once a day, and, and someone else may say, I could do another time of the day. And so we do something called blended care. Or many different agencies, you may have three or four agencies involved covering those hours. Or it may be that nobody can, and then home and community care is coming back to you to say, hey, you know what, it, you're on a wait list, uh, which is very unfortunate. Um, so sometimes it's not even a matter of getting approved, it's a matter of actually finding the staff. So it is important to determine what is most important to you. Um, you may say, okay, three times a day is great. However, 
even if I could get someone one time a day, I may be able to have my neighbor help me out in the evening, or you know, this is where it's gonna be most helpful until I can get full care. Um, so determining that is super important to work with your care coordinator on what exactly is going to work for you and what's available. Uh, so that being said, when you do have lots of agencies, keep a list of all of that information so you know who to contact, because it can get really confusing. In order to be eligible for these services, you basically just need a valid Ontario health card. Uh, your health care needs cannot be met on an outpatient basis. Um, that's when you qualify for in-home care. Um, you have a need for one professional or personal support service. Uh, and, a, and you have a medical condition that can be treated at home or in one of the nursing clinics. Community care. So uh, I sort of just touched on your physical needs. We say community care and community support services is more your psychosocial needs. So that includes your adult day programs, Meals on Wheels, volunteer visiting, hospice, transportation, and all sorts of other ones. Um, these services, again, are also confusing. <laughs> Uh, some are at no cost, some are a full pay, um, and some do have funding attached to it. Uh, some programs require a referral through home and community care. So for example, your adult day programs, the dementia care centers, those require a referral because you need to meet a certain criteria. Something like um, the memory visiting program or a volunteer visiting program, those you can sign up or uh, directly through the agencies that provide it because they don't require a referral from your physician or anybody. You can self-refer. Um, th there are many different organizations just like your home care services uh, that provide these services. So again, between the two companies, when you have these resources coming into your home, it does feel like Grand Central Station at times. Have a list, have a whiteboard, have something with all of your contact information uh, who to call for what service um, in case you need it, you're call, you make sure you're calling the right person. So a couple of scenarios to go through. And I find these scenarios are important because there's always someone that says, ooh, that's me, I'm Doug, that's exactly what's happening. And it, it kind of goes through your story. Uh, so these are common uh, calls that we get um, out of Claim Health, I'm sure you ask any home care agency, Jerry, I'm sure you get these all the time where people say, what do I do? Uh, so Doug is having knee surgery in June and is worried about recovery at home. He wants to plan ahead, what should he do? So one of the most frustrating parts uh, for people, I understand, is when you are, you know that you have something coming up, you know that you're gonna need help, uh, and you're asking your doctor in the hospital and you know everybody involved, well, who's gonna help me after my surgery? And everyone kind of says, well, I don't know. Um, so the important thing is to understand that when you are in the hospital, and healthcare providers are telling you they don't know because they don't know what your recovery is going to look like. Um, so they, they can't even plan ahead. But we're here waiting and, and wondering you know, what, what you're gonna need. So what happens when you go into the hospital, a care coordinator for the most part, will come up and assess you. And you can say, I would like to speak to somebody from home and community care. Um, and they will come up and assess you to determine what, if there's anything imminent that needs to be provided to you when you get home, they will put that in place. Or if there's nothing, you know, if you can manage for a day or two, somebody will contact you to do an assessment to determine what you need. So there can be a delay, so I always tell people, if there's something, if you know you're not gonna be able to cook or clean for yourself, there is not a lot of, if any, government-funded services that are going to do that for you. So have a family or have a friend or have an agency ready to go on hand to be there for you when you get home from hospital. Because uh, there are going to be gaps in your care that won't be met through the publicly funded system. However, if you have a wound um, that needs to be dressed, um, Things like that will be addressed. Whether or not they send you with a little card and say go to this clinic, um, or somebody's gonna call you with a clinic appointment, and you think, well I hope so, um, that you will get any of your physical needs met in that regards um, if your physician doesn't wanna do it themselves. So typically some doctors will say, I'm gonna address it, if not send home and community care to do it or go to a clinic. Um, so when you're in hospital, you will have that 
assessment or somebody to speak with. However, do have family, friends, and agencies, somebody to fill in those gaps when you come home. Linda lives in Ottawa, and her 92-year-old mother lives in Oakville. Her mother also just lost her license and has had multiple falls over the last couple of months. She is having difficulty with her personal care. Linda's mother has requested to stay at home as long as possible, but Linda worries about how she will manage everything with no local family or friends. What should Linda and her mother do? Um, so I would recommend that the first thing is Linda comes and visits her mother in Oakville for a couple of weeks. During that time is when she wants to get everybody together. So she's going to want to take her mom to her family physician, um, find out why is she having these falls? Is there a medication review that needs to be done? Is there something happening in the environment or is it a physical ailment that has changed in causing this? So talk to the doctor about those falls and find out if there's any resources that the family physician could possibly speed up for help. Uh, the other thing she could do while she's here is call home and community care and ask to have a care co coordinator come and assess her mom and talk about the services available. Uh, she can also reach out and get a volunteer visitor, perhaps, to visit uh, Linda or visit her mom in the home, just as that extra set of eyes, so she's not so socially isolated. She can look at meal programs. There's tons of different meal programs, Meals on Wheels, Heart to Home, all the things um, for somebody to make sure she's having her meals. Or she can have um, an agency come in and do some of her meal prep, uh, figuring out her housekeeping. Having someone come and organize that so that she has a housekeeper, whether again that's through uh, a seniors to seniors program um, or a, a private housekeeper that you can get. Um, so she should tackle all of those things. The other thing she's going to want to do is when she's visiting, really look at where is her mom struggling because her mom may be thriving during the day, do, going to all these programs that Linda may not realize. She may have a ton of support system, but after five o'clock, perhaps all that support goes away or things change in the evening. And so she may want to advocate to get the care in in the evening. So finding out where she most needs it. Um, and then just make some connections around here to see who's going to contact Linda if her mother needs help. If something's happening, who's going to be updating her? So scenario number three, Bob is 81 years old and lives with his 80 year old wife, Mary. Mary has been diagnosed with dementia and Bob has been the only caregiver for her. Bob is becoming exhausted and his health is now starting to decline. What should Bob do? So firstly, he needs to make an appointment with his family doctor. Naturally him um, and his wife should both be assessed, but it is so important for Bob to mention to his doctor that he's feeling burnt out. One of the situations we see a lot that does always end up in some form of crisis is where it's husband and wife, one is the primary caregiver and is physically well caring for their partner with dementia and something, and the caregiver's health deteriorates and they physically can't do it anymore. Then they're in a situation where neither can care for each other and then there's no planning involved and it's, it's not nice in any way, shape or form. So it's important for Bob to get the help he needs now to maintain his physical health. Uh, we always say, although Mary may be our patient, Bob is just as important and we also as healthcare providers need to make sure he's okay. Um, so he can look at getting into a day program, maybe a couple days a week, having Mary go there uh, by calling home and community care, uh, reaching out to the day programs in his area to go for a tour, see if it will work. Um, do an overnight stay at one of those respite programs um, to make sure that he has a scheduled break every week, whether it's one day or five days a week, whatever he needs to have a break. Um, he may also want to find out if he can get a PSW coming in the home for respite. Um, and if any of those are on wait list, he can look at agencies for private care to get those in there to help him out, um, to have them come in to help him stay with his wife while he gets a break, even if he wants to go take a nap, something. He can get a memory visitor coming in for once a week, uh, where it's one hour, it's a volunteer. They come in and just talk to Mary. And sometimes that's beneficial for Mary to have someone else to talk to other than Bob. Um, because she may be, as much as Bob may be hearing the same story every day, Mary's in that same environment and looking at him all day. So just a different face can be very beneficial. 
Um, as well, I would highly recommend Bob look at support groups. So even reaching out to the Alzheimer's Society um, or Acclaim Health has them as well, but lots of different uh, support groups where it can be educational support, it can be caregiver one-on-one -on -one support, uh, they have walking groups, which are really great, where you're just hanging out with other spouses going through the same thing. Um, or doing the educational series through the Alzheimer's Society as well. So he can be knowledgeable on what to expect, what the future is going to look like. Scenario number four. John has stage four lung cancer. John has told his family that he wants to die at home. John's family wants to support his decision, but are worried they may not be able to manage his care needs alone. Uh, what do they do? So again, John's family having a meeting with the family doctor as well as his care coordinator. Typically, for the most part at this point, when somebody is palliative, they do have some form of care in place at this point. So I would hope John does. Um, however, that's not to say he, he may not. So um, speaking to uh, home and community care, having a palliative care nurse come in, uh, and talking about what that may look like and that having his family as well as his, himself educated is extremely important. There are lots of services and I do tell families when a client is palliative and near end of life as things progress, a lot of services that they may not have had before do kick in. So often your nursing gets increased, your PSW gets increased, your equipment gets increased um, as long as you're advocating. So. Um, if the family and the nurse and the physicians are all communicating and you have a really good care team, things will increase your, as far as your services. Um, and you should, John's, there's no reason that he shouldn't be able to get what he wants. Um, there are lots of supports that will happen. Not to say, um, I know the system isn't perfect and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so community care tips. If staying at home as long as possible, uh, is what you want. Be honest about your care needs. So like I said before, resources are limited um, and if you don't speak up and ask for it, you won't get it. So it's very unfortunate we are not in a system right now where people encourage you to access the service that you, you really do have to ask for it. Um, so if somebody comes to assess you and says, you know, what do you, um, to find out what you qualify for. That's not a day to spend 10 hours doing your hair and makeup and putting on your best uh, outfit um, and saying, you know, well, I manage and I, I do really well and it's not a time to brag about things like that because that's when they're gonna say, okay, well, everything looks good here. Um, so you wanna make sure you're honest. You may be dressed that day, but did it take you two hours and are you in a lot of pain from doing that? that's something your care coordinator needs to know um, because that's when you could benefit from the help. Uh, so you wanna be honest about that. And advocate for yourself or have someone advocate for you. Uh, again, being silent and not asking for it, nobody's gonna come knocking on your door asking if you want your services increased. You really do need to advocate. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable, have somebody do that for you, a family, a friend, hire somebody, whatever you need to do. Um, make sure that you're, you're allowed. Um, have an emergency or backup plan. So I've worked in community care most of my career. Uh, it is great. I, I think it, it, for the most part, it's very reliable. If there's gaps, yes, I agree. Um, however, uh, community nurses and PSWs are facing a lot more challenges to get to you than you would if you were in the hospital or long-term care. Uh, when you're not in a predictable environment and your care is coming to you, there's a lot more risk of them not coming. Um, so I always give the example, if there is a terrible snowstorm and you were in the hospital or in your long-term care, somebody's gonna take care of you that day. It may be delayed, it may be a hectic day, uh, but you will get the care you need. If you are at home and you are waiting for a PSW to drive their Honda Civic down a street that is buried in five feet of snow, um, it's going to be delayed if it even comes. Somebody may not get to you till 10 o'clock at night uh, because they are dealing with those challenges. So have a backup plan. Do you have a neighbor that can help you? Um, what are you going to do if you can't get dressed that day? Are you okay to spend a day in your pajamas? Or are you incontinent and that isn't even an option? 
Um, so again, when we talked in the beginning about um, putting your plan in place, be realistic about what that looks like and consider those factors. If, if you are out of it, I'm never leaving my house and I need all the care here, be realistic about what that's going to look like and what you can put in place to ensure you're not gonna be in a dangerous situ situation. Um, again, when you are receiving home care, I can't stress this enough, your house becomes a revolving door. People are coming um, that you know you may never have met before and it can feel invasive uh, when they're coming into your home and you don't know who they are. So it is very important to keep a list of what agencies are involved. So you could say a claim health, nursing, quality care, PSW, with those um, phone numbers beside. So that if you know a PSW came in and if you have questions, it wasn't a good experience and whatnot, you're calling the right person. Or if you wanna know what time your nurse is coming. I've had many people call and say, what time will my nurse be here? And I'm digging through our system looking for a nurse assigned and it's not there, only to find out that it's another agency that has nursing. Um, so it can sound, it can be really frustrating when I'm on the other end saying, there's no nurse coming. And they're like, what? <laughs> so um, get yourself contact information. And if your care needs do exceed your government funded resources, again, when I go back to the beginning about making sure your plan's realistic and considering those factors, understand that if you want to be at home as long as possible, there will be some financial responsibility that you will have. Um, so again, unfortunately, we don't have free 24 hour care. Um, we don't have all of those resources. So you are going to need to pay at some point something to somebody to get all the care you need if your needs become complex. Here's a bunch of resources. Um, certainly we can send this out uh, later. What I will do to highlight here, if you live in Burlington, I'm assuming the bulk of you are from Burlington, the main number you're going to want from here is H&HB Home and Community Care. Um, that is your HCCSS, the local branch. If you need a care coordinator or you need community services, that is your best place to start. Um, and even if it's something that they don't provi provide, they will give you the contact information of the people that do, as well as the Alzheimer's Society is um, another great resource. Um, there's the Halton Seniors Directory. So I'll leave that up for about a second. However, I'm aware of the time constraints. So uh, if you need that information later, I'm sure we can get that to you if you need it. Okay, retirement homes. Again, uh, now I understand there is a session coming up uh, that really talks about housing, retirement homes, and all that, so I'm going to try to keep this pretty minimal. Um, what uh, I want you to be aware of when it comes to retirement homes is that these are this is the difference between long-term care and retirement. So retirement homes are not government funded. It's a more independent living style, uh, as well as they do have assisted living areas of retirement homes you apply directly through the home. So you can decide, decide, hey, I want to live at Tansley Woods. You head straight to Tansley Woods and kind of sign up through them and look at the suites. Um, you don't apply through home and community care. Uh, the rooms are generally private um, have, and have a larger variance on what they look like. You can have full apartments, um, however the cost change. So the cost for, for retirement homes can be anywhere from 3,500 a month to 10,000 a month. So, uh, whereas long-term care is very structured, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but um, it's a huge range of how much a retirement home uh, is going to cost you. Wait times are generally shorter, non-existent for the most part. Um, it's like uh, get, signing up a lease with an apartment. Uh, if there's a room, then you're good. Um, and some homes, this is really important, some retirement homes have care options and some do not. So you wanna find that out right from the beginning, um, asking, do you have an assisted living floor? Do you have a memory care unit? Uh, both of those are gonna determine what you're looking for. If it is an independent living style building, you need to understand that that means if you need a shower, if you need help getting your socks on, if you need anything, it's not there, other than the PSWs coming in through home and community care. So if you're moving into an apartment or a retirement home because you can no longer manage your personal care at home, 
that may not be your best choice unless you're going to move into a retirement home that has an assisted living environment. Um, if you're moving into a retirement home because you're managing your personal care, but you just want that so socialization and you don't want to cook and clean anymore, an independent living environment is perfect. Um, so that's sort of the difference, whereas long-term care, we'll talk about you need to have high care needs to move in. So long-term care, and again, there are, I, I will be very transparent with you, I am not the expert on long-term care. My jam is community. Um, so I do talk a little bit about how to apply for it, but there are tons of presentations and resources on long-term care. Um, so I may not be your best bet for that, but I can give you a little bit of information. Uh, so long-term care is government subsidized for those with high care needs and is regulated through the Long-Term Care Act, Homes Act. Uh, the government does pay a portion of the cost and then the resident pays the other. However, finances will never be in your way to live in long-term care. Um, so the government will pay what they need to to ensure that you have a place to live. As the government sets the rates, not by the homes. So even if you have a very beautiful home and they decide they want to paint the walls, they can't jack up your rent because they put a new coat of paint. Um, so that's all, all set by the government. So to access long-term care. All of the applications for long-term care go through home and community care. So that's the community people we were talking about earlier. And if you want to move into long-term care and you want to be assessed for long-term care, you have to go through home and community care. And that care coordinator will be the one to go through that application process with you. You have to meet a criteria. Um, so you can't just say, you know what, I don't want to cook and clean anymore, but retirement homes are really expensive, so sign me up. Um, you have to have a certain amount of care needs. Um, there are very long wait lists. I, I think that's no secret um, that those wait lists can be long. So you may go through all this application process and then they say, okay, you know, maybe a couple of years from now. So you want to make sure that you're having those conversations when you are, are ready to have them, but also not waiting until you're in a crisis. Don't wait until, you know, if you're like, yeah, long-term care, I, I, that's what I'd like to do, that's, I have a home in mind, I'd like to explore that option. Don't wait until you absolutely need to move in tomorrow, um, because that, that won't happen. You'll be in a bad situation. So basically what happens, a care coordinator comes out, does that whole assessment, uh, you can choose up to five homes, they will then send that application through, and then they're the ones that notify you when it's ready. And just so you know, you don't have to choose all five homes. You can choose one, you can choose two, um, and you can choose them in any area. So just because you live in Burlington, you can still choose a home in Thunder Bay. And you can put one in Burlington and one in Thunder Bay in, on your list. And they will still process that application for you. Um, once you get, so once a bed is available in one of the homes of your choice, the care coordinator contacts you and you have 24 hours to accept or reject that offer. If you accept it, you have five days to move in. If you reject it, it is true your name is removed off of the list and you cannot reapply for 12 weeks. So some people will say, well, that's not my number one choice and I'm not moving in there. How, what you can do to sort of get around that is accept that offer. So say, okay, I'm gonna move in, but I really want that Thunder Bay home because that's where my daughter lives or whatever it may be. You can accept choice number two, move into it and stay on the list for choice number one. So it doesn't mean that your choice number one is gone, especially for spousal reunification. All of that is taken into consideration where your family lives, all of that will keep you on a certain spot on the list. So you want to make sure it just, you're almost better off if you're okay with it to move in and keep your name on list number one versus if you reject it, you're kicked out for 12 weeks to reapply. So there are lots of, like I said before, there are tons of presentations and resources on long-term care and I know that there is something coming up on housing and access to all of that. Um, however, this is uh, a long-term care booklet um, and there is a number as well to, in Burlington to speak with the care coordinator about a long-term care application. Uh, and this guide is available on a whole, it's, it's very blurry there, so you won't be able to see it, but it's the Halton Care OHT website. 
Uh, so again, if you really want this guide, let me know later and I can certainly get that to you. I'm sure we can organize it. So some final thoughts, and I actually I just made it in time. <laughs> Uh, if you want to stay in your home, there are tons of resources, supports, and options. It can be really challenging to navigate your way through, so don't do it alone. Um, have somebody help you through it and just know that they are available. You need to be loud. You need to advocate uh, to get those services. Um, it is never too early or to, early to think about what your wishes are, develop a plan, and talk to the important people in your life. Um, if you're prepared, you're going to be ready, and you can research those things prior to you actually needing it, so you can be realistic about your expectations as well. Um, and just call someone. If, if you don't know, call someone who's gonna take the time to explain this all to you, because it can be very challenging. People have had services for years and have no idea that a day program exists, or you know they've been caring for someone with dementia and have no idea that there's support groups out there. Um, so it's just a matter of trying to educate people that these things do exist. Uh, okay, there's my information. However, that is the end of my portion of the presentation. Uh, Mary will introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Alyssa. A couple of things that Alyssa said that really um, stuck out with me is you don't need your doctor to call the Lynn or the community health, community home and health care services, whatever. You can do that on your own. So don't feel that you need a referral there. And the other part of um, in assist, if you're going to retire at home and you're looking at assisted living, there are homes that that care can be provided. It's just not coming from the home. It's coming through a different channel. So um, just don't discount that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in retirement living, there are actually independent supportive living buildings where they do provide care that goes into your suite. There's not as many totally independent. I would say in Burlington, Heritage Place doesn't have, uh, they have access to a claim for their care, but they don't actually offer it themselves through Heritage Place. Most other buildings in Burlington are independent supportive living as your independent portion. So they do offer supportive services like showers and PM care to get you up, get you dressed, that sort of thing. And they do provide medication administration, things like that. So those actually happen in most of the buildings in Burlington. What you need then to look for, if you think your care needs are going to exceed that, then you would look for assisted living and memory living. But most buildings, except for very few, offer independent supportive living. Thanks, Jeanette. And we will, as Melissa said, we're going to have another presentation on retirement homes. So we'll be covering all the retirement homes in the area, what makes them the same, what makes them different. That will be coming up in uh, April. Um, okay, on to the next phase. Thank you. Okay. Um, can everybody hear me? No. We need for this, yeah. I typically don't like to use but I will, because um, I like to walk around a lot. So, um, uh, thank you, Alyssa, for sharing all of that information. So, I don't know about you, but I feel really muddy about things when we think about our health system. Um, I've been in healthcare for 36 years. I've done a number of different things. Um, and currently, I moonlight as a hospice nurse. I'm a palliative care um, advanced practice nurse. Um, so that's another thing I do in addition to many of the other things I do. Um, but my biggest joy comes from helping people understand and navigate the system because it is a very, very challenging system. It is not easy. Um, it is complex. It's complicated. It's underfunded. It's under-resourced. Um, it is a crisis. So I'm going to be the, the bearer of bad news, but we are in a health crisis. Um, and, and it's unfortunate, but there are ways in which we can work through this together. Um, because I think that um, our, our aging population is one of the most um, 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 unrecognized um, areas of healthcare that need the most support. Okay? And most of our health dollars are actually spent at the beginning of life and at the end of life. 
that's where most of the Ontario health dollars are being spent. Um, and so we do need to sort of get this straight. So I titled this, um, um, my little portion here, as the unexpected cost of aging. Because nobody really wants to talk about the cost. Um, but I want to give you some of my experience that I have. So this is how I gain most of my knowledge is through experience and working with people. So every time I, I either do one of these presentations or I work with a client, I always learn from them. So I'm always open to understanding more and more about what's going on in our system um, and how to best help people. But I just wanted to share this um, diagram with you, which is really what happens as we age because we don't like to talk about it right like it's kind of this taboo thing to talk about aging but there is this opportunity to age with grace with dignity and to enjoy our golden years right and that's what we really want to try and do is we want to try and improve our quality of living and that should be our north star and to continue to think about what's going to make my life better or what's going to maintain it to the level that i feel comfortable with and i'm satisfied with because that's the most important thing so as we age, you know, we think about this idea of our declining mobility. That's the thing that gets us the most, is our inability to be physical and to be able to care for our physical needs. So we need to be thinking about this ahead of time um, and thinking about what does it mean as I age and things start to slow down for me and what will that look like? Because if I can understand what it'll look like, I might be able to anticipate some of the needs that I might have. And when we talk about planning ahead, it's hard to plan ahead if we don't really understand what's ahead of us, right? So that idea of really being able to understand what happens to our function. So it's also about our brain, right? And I, and I don't think there's anyone in this room that hasn't thought about dementia and Alzheimer's. And I think it, it, most of us are worried about that as time goes on. We don't know enough about it. We don't know what prevents it. We don't know what causes it, per se. Um, we have some ideas and strategies that can help in some ways. But it's something that we're, a lot of us are worried about, about losing our cognitive ability. And that's a real true fear that many of us have. It's also about being able to manage. And I've seen lots of people in my um, experience that are, are begin to um, have difficulty managing their banking, difficulty managing their home environment, and need that support and help. And so when we think about how do I get that support and help, it can be very complicated. Like as you heard Alyssa talk about, there's many different resources, but how do we access them? Um, and then we also have our basic needs that, are, uh, that we need to be thinking about. And one of the number one reasons why women end up in long-term care homes is because of incontinence. I don't know if anyone knows that, um, if anyone wants to talk about that, but that's the reality of the situation. And so, there's things that we can do to help support and prevent that from happening, but we have to start it early, and if we're not talking about it, then we're not able to start it early enough. And so it's something that we need to be speaking freely and open about. Um, we also have a number of different conditions, and there's this one condition that um, really has been, um, uh, we, we've held off on actually labeling it as a disease or a disorder, but that's called frailty. And many of us, whether, you know, if you live long enough, you will experience frailty. And frailty is when we begin to have a decline in our, in our, um, our function, in our ability to care for ourselves. And we actually have a frailty scale. And as you progress through life, typically you become higher and higher on that frailty scale. We start to experience things like arthritis, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, blood pressure issues. And so we need to be able to say that this is, this is part of a disease spectrum or a, a, a complication spectrum because if we, don't, we, if we don't label it and we don't identify it, we won't get the care that it deserves. And so somebody will say, well, yeah, you have arthritis, yeah, you have high blood pressure, yeah, you have a little bit of memory loss, but all these things combined together can really impact our quality of life. But we can do things about it if we can actually identify it as an issue. And so if we live long enough, we will experience that frailty. And so when we think about death and dying and as time progresses and what people die from, people actually don't die from old age. You don't die from getting old. You die from the complications that arise in your organs as you age. Right? So cardiovascular disease, cancers, lung disease, kidney disease, they all increase the risk as we increase our age. So we can grow old and healthy 
and well and have a fabulous life right up until our last breath. We just have to be able to identify what's happening to our bodies and, and how we can be able to tr treat that. Um, and so the other things that we have to face is this long wait list of alternative levels of housing and community. Every client that I work with, almost every client, there's a small handful that don't tell me that they want to live the rest of their life in their own home. So how many of you have thought about that and think, I'd like to live the rest of my life in my own home? Yeah, the majority of us do, right? We become attached. We become attached to our place of living. It's meaningful for us. It's who we are. It represents us. And it's important to us. And we want to stay there. You know, I tell my parents, I joke with them, I tell them that you need to start like purging a little bit of your stuff because you got a lot of stuff in the basement. I don't want to have to go through that when you die. And so now my mom, when we walk in her house, she's like, do you want to take this mug home with you? No, mom, I don't want your mug. Or she'll say, can you put your name on the back of anything you want? Because the next I'm going to ask you, I'm like, no, mom, I don't want any of your stuff. <laughs> but she wants to give it away now because I've told her we need to start purging a little bit. But it's true, they do. They honestly do. I need to purge. I need to purge. So all of us need to do that. But we really get attached to our homes, right? And, and that's, it defines us. And so what can we do to continue to live in, a, in that environment? And a lot of it is looking at, is it possible? And can we bring in other people to help support us at home? Um, and that's where it becomes complicated. And that's where I see, I work with, you know, some of the, the most wealthy people in our society who cannot stay in their home because we don't have the physical resources to allow them to stay in their home. And we don't have, so even, it doesn't matter how much money you have, if there's not somebody to come in, or if the geographical structure cannot allow for it, then it just not, it doesn't become possible. So we have to think about possibilities as well. So it's not just about our wants, but it's what's possible. What can we actually achieve that's gonna help us stay in our homes? And then also, when I think about, you know, life and living, what do you think is the most important thing in life? Health, yeah. Money is important, but it's not everything, though, right? Exactly. That's it. You know what it is? It's relationships. It's relationships with one another. So you're right. Your wife is the most important person because it's probably your most important relationship. But that's what this, what's so important is relationships. So to begin those relationships now with people that may need to support you later. And I'm not talking about your children, because we all know that you know, we, we rely on our children. If you don't have children, we rely on our siblings or rely on our, our, the people that are important in our lives. Maybe our neighbors, maybe our, our siblings, maybe our, um, our nieces and nephews, or our children. We, we do have an expectation that as time goes on, somebody's gonna try and support us, right? Like we're hoping that people are gonna come to the table, especially like, I think about my parents and all the support that they gave me, and I would hope that I would be able to repay them. Today I called my son, he's 26 years old, and I said, can you bring my business cards down because I only have one, because I have two businesses, right? I only have the one set, and I might need the other set. And I'm thinking to myself, he better not give me any grief for all the help that I've <laughs> I tell you, I swear to God. And so then, I, I, so I texted this morning as I'm running to my one um, meeting that I'm going to, and, and so he gets back to me and he's like, right on, mom, just give me the address. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> so this is paying off, right? So we do, we expect that, because that's about relationships, right, and how important they are. So you have a bunch of people right here that you need to develop relationships with, okay? Jeanette, raise your hand. So Jeanette is, she is an amazing person that helps with fluid transitions. Okay? These are the relationships that you need to develop. Because these are the ones that you can start talking to. I hear there's somebody that's, you know, you're from the industry with, with hearing. Was it hearing? Yeah. And so thinking about that, right? Like, what if my hearing starts to go, well, maybe I should figure out who's in our, my community that can help me. You know, and somebody else here that helps with death and dying, right? And somebody who helps with finances. Like, these are all my friends. And we call it, these people are trusted relationships. Somebody who helps with real estate. These are the relationships you need to start thinking about. That's what's going to help your quality of living. That's what's going to help you live your best life. 
to be able to establish those things early enough. You know, and, and Alyssa talked about thinking about the homes. I, I, I've been doing a lot of work with um, long-term care, with assisted living, with retirement living. I can give you story after story after story. I won't, I won't entertain you with all of that, but um, I, I, I can you know, share many of my experiences with you. Um, but I think it's important for people to be thinking about where is it in my environment that maybe I'd like to go if I can't stay in my own home. You know, there's a couple of really great places that have wonderful staff that, um, that can, can really support you. But we have to be realistic about it as well. So I want to just, you know, share with you. I, I, I like graphics. I, you know, and when I talk to my clients, these are the questions we talk about. Like, what's the, what's the uh, line in the sand that you're willing to draw? Or that you don't want to go past in order to gain more time in life? What's your quality of living look like? You know, uh, what do you want to do with your, um, you know, for your funeral arrangements? What are your beliefs, your values? Who do you want to see as the last person before you die? What does your environment look like as you age? Um, what's your financial resources that are going to help you get there? So that's all about advanced care planning. All of you should do it. I'll tell you, only 30% of Canadians have done advanced care planning. And even fewer have done a documented advanced directive. That's another specialty of mine. I'm not here to sell you that, but I'm just here to tell you and remind you that it's so important and that's going to help you get what you want. Look at all the things that we can access. Here is your home, living in your home. But there's all these other places and all these other services that can help you as time progresses through your life. And some of them can overlap. You know, we can get respite care while we're getting home care because maybe we need a little bit, right? Our family needs a little bit of a break. Um, or we, maybe we need a little bit of a break as a caregiver. Caregiver burnout, huge. That's a whole other talk, caregiver burnout. But this is the reality here. Okay, so right now I'm helping somebody who is, you know, fabulous woman. She's 96 years old. She used to be a bartender. I love her. She's great. She's like, what kind of cocktail do you want today? I don't know. How about a Cosmo? <laughs> I like Martini Dry. Um, but yeah, she's an amazing person. She owned a, um, an apartment in Toronto. Um, six, six units she owned. Um, she was frauded out of the majority of her money. Another topic that we should be talking about is, is uh, fraud, senior fraud. Um, but anyway, I've become her pseudo person because her people are all in Germany. And so this is just the, this is the cost of her living. Okay, so her base a cost for her retirement community. So again, as Jeanette had said, people that are in there that can provide support. She gets breakfast, or she gets lunch and dinner, I've added breakfast because she can't manage breakfast. She gets somebody to help her back and forth to her room. She gets um, bathed three times a week, twice by the Lynn, once by the home. Um, they pop in on her, they take out her garbage, and they clean up her apartment every once in a while. And that costs her $5,500 for that. In addition to that, I've had to add a whole bunch of other services for her. So I've had to add medication um, provision. I've had to add escorting, transferring. She needs breakfast as well. Um, she needs some personal supplies, so her, her personal care needs, such as um, she has pull up, she has hang on, certain shampoos, certain creams that she needs. Um, she needs a little bit of extra personal care and I need to do something to do her personal laundry because I live an hour away from her. And so all of this is costing her $9,000. So that's the reality, that's the hidden cost that we don't know. When she went into the home, um, she has dementia, not late stage, not early stage either. I'd say there's moments of lucidity. Um, and and she, you know, like she, I can sit with her in a room and we have a conversation for four hours, and it's a great conversation. Sometimes it's the same thing over and over, but I, I actually find her quite entertaining. So I really enjoy um, her company, and and so we spend lots of time together. And when I first, you know, transferred her from hospital to this um, uh, retirement community, I thought, wow, this is lickety split. Everything looks great. I've got everything in place for her. I got home and 15 minutes later, I got a call from home. She wants to leave. I said, okay, um, so tell me what we do. What do we do? 
And uh, the uh, care coordinator said, she goes, I don't know, Miss Sandra, I think you need to come back in. I said, well, I can't, I can't come back in. Like, she's not my family, she's my client. And so um, I said, okay, come on, Dorothy, work with me, Dorothy. What do we do, what do we do? Tell me what we do. And she goes, I'll give you a number. She goes, you call Anne, and Anne will get you care. I said, okay, who's Anne? She's a nice person. I said, okay. <laughs> Hi, Ann, I hear you're a nice person. I need somebody. When do you need them for? I need them for, in like, yesterday. And she says, okay, I'll be there in a half an hour. So Ann came in and provided one-on-one -on -one care, 24-7 for two weeks until my, my lady settled, until she was able to feel okay being there and stopped asking to go back home. Because they said if she wants to leave, we have to let her leave. That's a whole other conversation we can have about capacity and being able to leave a facility. When I'm thinking she's really safe there, I'm really happy, I'm elated, I'm going out and I'm buying myself a beer that night because I'm, whoo, she's in a home, I feel so good, I did the right thing by her, and then I'm like, what? You're gonna let her leave? You can't! <laughs> so these wonderful carers came in and they provided one-on-one -on -one services, private service, right? Um, that private service cost us over $8,000 for two weeks. So she now has COVID. So I'm gonna call this weekend. She's got COVID, okay. So what do we do? Well, she wants to come out of her apartment. She can't come out of her apartment. Okay. Can she come out with a mask on? She won't wear the mask. Can we test her to make sure she has COVID? She won't be tested. She won't let, let us test. You need to come. So I, over the weekend I went in and Saw, saw my babe, and she, I said, come on, let's, I'm gonna do the test, and she goes, you get away from me. I'm like, okay, but remember, I'm the person you like. So anyway, the carers are back this week. So we're gonna end up having to do another one-on-one -on -one until, because she can't leave her room, but she doesn't understand about not leaving her room. So that's the hidden costs. These are the things that are unexpected, that nobody really, knows about until you start to experience it. I've been in healthcare for 36 years. I didn't actually realize some of the things that were gonna happen, so I couldn't anticipate. And this is what I, when I started by saying, I learn every time I work with somebody. And I keep my eyes, my ears, my brain open for more information coming in. Because I think it's important that we're able to understand our system and find the people. So please form those relationships with people. Think about these things. And some of these things we can't prevent. The other thing I just want to make mention of, because I do work for a law firm, and um, and the reason I do that, the reason I work for a law firm is not because, you know, no offense to lawyers, I love my lawyer friends, but I don't, I don't work there because, you know, it's the ability to work with lawyers. It's because I know that lawyers don't often understand what happens in the health system, so I want to educate them too and help them understand that when you create a power of attorney for personal care and for property, those two people need to work together. Because one's the purse, one's the person. And if those two people don't understand what you want, there might be arguments about how much money is given over to, um, to supplement your, your healthcare services or to adapt your home or to add assistive devices. And so there's this back and forth. So those two people have to work together. I can tell you tons of stories of when this has gone awire and things don't go the way they're planned. And if any of you have children that have ever had been in conflict, trust me, when stresses arise, that conflict becomes tenfold. So you know, if you're um, um, identifying multiple children to be your decision maker, just remember that they all have to get along and be able to make good decisions on your behalf. Um, I'm not gonna go into much detail because I'm gonna leave some time. So. Always happy to come back and share more information with you, but. Yeah, we're gonna, I think there's gonna be one more person that had, oh, nope, no, nope. okay, so we're gonna have questions. Okay, so this is just my little depiction of, isn't this a beautiful picture? So it's, I think it says something like, good planning allows us the peace of mind to live our best life until our last breath. That's my trademark, but live best life until the last breath. So if you hear that from anyone else, that I, I think I came up with that, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, I really, I love working with 
the senior population. I am close to being senior myself. I think I actually get a discount at Shoppers Drug Mart now, so I can reach the age where I actually get a discount, so I go on Tuesdays as well, Shoppers Drug Mart, 10%. That's almost the taxes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I really appreciate the struggles. The struggle is real, and I'm here to help support as many of my trusted colleagues are as well. Um, and so thank you for, to Mary and for bringing this to our community because it's so important for us to open up these discussions. Thanks, Sandra. Actually, before I just comment on Sandra, Neela, at your presentation in July, you talked about where we're heading in terms of the healthcare system, not to freak anybody out, but just to go listen. So I will uh, agree with what Sandra said. Could you stand up, Neela? Can you tell I'm standing up? <laughs> <laughs> and, speak, and speak louder, please. Sorry. I will agree with what Sandra said. From all the research that we're seeing right now, the planning that we're going into for clients, the healthcare system is in a crisis, and it's not just the dollars allocated that the government's able to allocate for long-term care. It's the amount of beds that aren't coming in online. It's the shortage now of personal support workers and nurses. The trend line post-COVID from uh, 2032 to 2033 has actually come down now to 2027, 2028. So there's uh, 33,000 PSW and um, nurse shortage right now. In Ontario, the wait list to get into long-term care post-COVID is still over 30,000. So I can't agree more that when it comes to thinking about who are your important people, who's there to support you, have you had those conversations with them? My dad was a doctor and he used to tell me that the worst place to start your decision making is while you're lying in ICU or the hallway. Mm. Thanks, Neela. So we're not here to scare you. We're here to educate you and inform you and help, help to, uh, to make you better prepared and to, and as Sandra said, and all, all of our colleagues here are here to help when the time is right for you and maybe when the time isn't right. We're really looking to avoid a crisis to get some education and some information to all of us so that we can be better prepared for the days ahead. So we'll be, we'll happily open the floor to questions. Okay, Marie. Very quickly, Sandra. Um, it was an interesting story about your heart and your friend. Yeah. If we segue into the POA, who was for the POA? So um, the POA in her situation lives in Germany. So her POA lives in Germany. She has no family here. She had a husband, uh, and her husband was, uh, is deceased. And her nephew, who lived in Canada, moved to Germany. And so he's her only, the, her niece and nephew are her only living relatives, and they are in Germany. And they're both, for, he's both for POA, for property, and for personal care. Yeah, and not, it's absolutely not ideal. The other op opportunity for her would be public guardian and trustee. And in some ways, you know, I actually recently said to one of the lawyers looking after her case that it probably would have been easier for PGT to take over her case, but unfortunately, they won't because she has officially, by legal papers, appointed a, another person who's doing a wonderful job. Don't get me wrong; he's very accessible. We FaceTime all the time. We're in touch by email. Like I could call today, and I would get a response from him in a couple of hours. So they, he's actually signed things over for me to act in his absence, and the team has gotten to really know me as well. So it, it, it works, but it is absolutely not one of, uh, not ideal at all. So yes. How did she find you? Oh, so she found me through the law firm. So they did a. Uh, they needed somebody to help with her finances, and so I always get these calls saying. Does anyone know anybody that can help with A, B, and C? And then inevitably they circle to me and say, hey, can you help? And so I've actually gone probably beyond what I would normally do, but um, I just uh, I have a, I have a, a very um, um, soft heart for people who are vulnerable. And I found that she's extremely vulnerable and they needed support. So that's how they, they ended up finding me is through the, through the law firm. Yeah, a question for Elise. You, you talked about assessments um, that you can sell or 
you can self-refer or finally refer, uh, asking for a friend. Uh, and you also talked about the pride or the honesty getting in the way. How, how often can you get assessed? Like, oh, yeah, so you mean by home and community care once? So you, you get your initial assessment once you contact them and say, hey, you know, I'm struggling at home, I need some help. Can you come out and take a look at everything and see what I qualify for? They do that, they make a decision on what you get, uh, but your care coordinator should be reassessing you every six months, or if you go in and out of hospital, uh, getting reassessed, or if your needs change. However, um, that doesn't often happen, the basic reassessment. So for us, at Acclaim being one of the service providers for home and community care, uh, once you have, let's say, PSW service coming in every day, you will have a care manager from the company in which is coming up to you. So if it's Acclaim Health, you have a care manager who also then comes into your home right when you come on service. They do their own assessment and also go back to home and community care uh, sometimes we'll call and say, like, are you kidding me that once a week? Or we'll say, yeah, like, you know, it sounds about right. So that is eyes on your care as well. We can make suggestions, and we do all the time. Uh, and then we are supposed to also see you every six months. It's, during COVID, they said every one to two years, and now it's gone back to every six months. So there's a massive backlog. Uh, for both home and community care and any service provider getting in to reassess you. However, we get calls all the time from people saying, you know, care coordinator has been out here two years, uh, or I haven't had a care manager out here in two years. And so just by suggesting that, we will call and say, you need to get out reassessed. So you can call your care coordinator and say, can you come and reassess me? Because things have changed, uh, or a friend has changed. I've gone into people's homes, who can't even transfer and they're still at you know a PSW once a week and haven't had that reassessment. So you should be able to get it even if you request it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's because the person I'm asking for is my mother and she she gets assessed and she, she does the whole I'm fine, she does the, the spend two hours right. struggling and then says, oh, I'm, I'm looking good, I cook for myself. And then we know that's not true. Uh, but she feels she's being honest. So I think, so I, I guess I'm trying to find out how heavily do I have to start out? Yeah, so in that, that's hard. That is a really hard situation. Um, so as you need to be her advocate and say, hey, you know, not necessarily, can I talk to you on the side or can I call you later? Uh, sure, she got dressed, but this is what happened. Something like that I would also say to the care coordinator, uh, ask them to do an OT assessment. So have an occupational therapist go, because they're the ones that can really look at, sure, she got dressed, but how safe was it when she was doing that? You know, what were the risks of her falling during that time? So even that one OT visit, uh, if your mother's willing and will accept it, uh, could be very beneficial to uh, changing up some services. But it is hard, and I've said to people as well, even to some clients, say, you know, I'm not necessarily ready, or I can do it. If someone's willing to give you the help, act on it now, and, and even saying, you know, let them make you breakfast then. If you can manage getting dressed, let them come in and build that relationship. And sometimes you do need to work with your mom to say, it's really important you get this now, because if you really need it, you can't get help, it may take some time. So if they're willing to give it to her, yeah, but, you just have to advocate. <laughs> yes. Okay, I'm passing it back. <laughs> so, um, Sandra's a good friend of mine and a good friend of many of us. Uh, the great thing about us all knowing each other is that quite often in our profession, so I'm sitting with families who may be looking at cemetery or funeral arrangements. And in sitting with them, I'm learning that there's a lot of other assistance they need. And how awesome is it that I can say, hey, I've got this wonderful lady I know who can help you with such. So it's not so much a question, but Sandra, mostly for the audience. Um, I've reached out to Sandra and said, hey, I have a family, they're in distress, mom's not well, 
um, they don't know where to look, they don't know where to start. So I guess what I'm asking is just to share with people at what point would people call you because you have such a wide spectrum of amazing things you do to help people. But in that everyday situation, at what point are people calling you before a crisis, in a crisis, and what is it that you'll be doing? So thanks so much. Um, so one of the things that I think is really challenging for people is navigating the health system. So there's a few things, like when we talk about advanced care planning, this is when we have something abstract in front of us and then what if this happens in life and then it's very hard to predict, but it is important just to be talking about putting together advanced directives and I call them roadmaps for your decision makers so that that can kind of help them navigate this tricky landscape of healthcare and understand some of the things that you want for yourself. Like we talk about CPR, we talk about feeding tubes, we talk about residential, personal care, how you like your hair done, how you like to be dressed, so that people understand what your wishes are. Like I always say to my kids, I don't like runny eggs, so make sure that nobody gives me runny eggs if I'm in a long-term care home. So those are things that are part of an advanced directive. But then there's this crisis mode that people find themselves in where they are trying to navigate the system and they're not certain on how to do that. They don't even know, you know, and nobody's really giving them the, the answers that are resonating with them to help them resolve that solution or that problem. And so oftentimes that's when people will reach out, especially those uh, amongst my colleagues and my friends that know the type of work I do and the knowledge that I have they'll reach out in the midst of crisis. So I've had people reach out from Florida to say, my dad's in the ICU, we need to get him back home. How do we do that? I've talked to Floridians to say, hey, don't call the, the family doctor, call Critical, this is the system, this is how we work through it, this is how we get our people back home. So that's just one example. I've had somebody call me to say, you know, they're, they're letting my loved one leave the residential retirement home and they're telling me that um, that they they can't that they by law have to do that. Well, actually, the person has already failed the test of capacity. They've already been diagnosed with a cognitive disorder. We already know that they cannot make decisions on the, on their own. So you cannot allow them to make a decision to leave the home. Oh, okay, thanks. Good information. I didn't know that. And this is to health professionals, right? That I'm telling them like you cannot let this person leave the home. And like here's the laws and here's our healthcare consent act. Here's the social decisions act. And so we're going through this with people. So nobody should be expected to know all this information. Like how would you ever know that information, right? So that's when people tend to give me a call and say, Hey Sam, can you um, help me figure this out? Sometimes it's just a matter of here's what you need to ask your health professionals. So recently I was working with somebody whose doctor refused to sign the do not resuscitate confirmation form. Gentleman with late stage dementia, already arrested once, already brought into hospital, back home, and the family physician went in and said, hey, do you want resuscitation or not? And the patient, or the person said, I want to fight till the end. And so he walked out and said, sorry, I can't sign the form. So she called me in a panic saying, I don't know what to do because I know it's a horrific thing that somebody has to go through. And he's already put on his living will that he, you know, I think it says that he doesn't want this. Send it to me, let me read it. So then my coaching to her was, you need to ask the family doctor to do a capacity assessment for the proposal of CPR. You have to understand and appreciate that. If he fails that capacity assessment, they have to turn to you. Um, and, and so that's the one thing, the CPSO guidelines, College of Physicians and Surgeons tells us that we don't have to offer CPR if it's not appropriate and applicable to the situation. And then the last is explore what he means by fighting to the end. Not everyone means that they want CPR. Sometimes it means just do everything you can to keep me comfortable. Allow me to have a beautiful exit of this world and don't interrupt my dying process. That might be fighting to the end. So we have to do all these things in order to really understand what he wanted for himself. Because his POA is saying, if I have a cognitive disorder that is incurable and not, um, and there is nothing more that can be done, please do not do heroics, which means no CPR and no surgery. That was in his directive. And his physician is saying, I want to sign no CPR. So I wrote that all in a memo to this person. She then shared it with her family physician. And guess what happened? So he died. He died the way he had asked her. So those are things, those are kind of some of the things that I, I, I deal with and I help support people try and navigate this system. Yeah. That's wonderful. But there's a lot of us. And so we want to do I know. How do we 
And so by the end of it, I had four nurses gathered around my bed saying, so how do we do what you do? And I'm like, I know, right? Like, there are people that want to help. There are people out there that want to help. It's just we've not created this role of navigation. And the ones that we did have in the province, um, last time I looked at the site, they're not there. So, I mean, I'm happy to leave people my, my business card. And I, you know, making these connections, right? Like, and knowing who to call and when to call um, is important. Um, if you have somebody who's in the health profession in your family, they tend to be the people that you know you would turn to to ask. But oftentimes they're not certain of, of the information either. I just have the I have the um, I have the privilege of having worked in healthcare from birth to death. So in my experience, I've been to over two thousand births, and I have been to over two hundred deaths, and so maybe even more than that, probably. More and so I have the advantage of being um, born into a family that allowed me to do a profession um, that I love to do, and, um, and I've been able to absorb all that information throughout my career. So I feel very privileged in that way, and that's why I'm here to share with everybody else what I know. So um, it may not be that you find too many people that do the same thing that I do. I'm part of um, a larger group called Elder Care Planners of Canada. So if you go on their website, you will see others across the country. And we're trying to build up this network of navigators across Canada. So we're pushing hard and just, I know there's many more people that want to do and want to help as you know Sandra and I do, and I am, I'm encouraging, in fact, I met a, a charge nurse today who was on her way to retirement and said, I want to do what you do, call me, is what I said. <laughs> so anyways, there you are. Just one other way is actually, so from the kids' perspective, is have honest conversations. If they're not prepared to have those conversations with you, you have them with them. So I was very fortunate that both of my parents, we were able to sit down together and we had the POAs there, and it was, what do you want? One wanted to die at home, one wanted to die at the hospital. One wanted a big funeral, the other one wanted a little funeral. One wanted a big wake, the other one didn't. But I would say, I was able then to understand. So I was grateful to them. I don't know whose idea it was, but right now I'm calling that, planting that seed in your heads that if they're not, if kids aren't gonna talk to you, you talk to them and, and help them understand. So you don't need a professional. You just need to have open and honest conversation. And even at the end, my mom said, I wanted to stay, I wanted to, to be here till the end. Well, what is the end? Like, we need to define the end. Was it, do I want to die at home or do I want to stay here as long as I can? And those were so very, very determined and direct conversations that aren't easy. Can I just add to that? So, like, one of the roles that I played in healthcare was I was a healthcare ethicist for Hamilton Health Sciences for um, about 10 years. So, I was responsible for all of the seven sites and outpatient clinics that we have. And so in my role as a hospital ethicist, I was called in to do conflict resolution. And typically, and this is why I do the work I do now, because what I was noticing was that most of the conflict happened when people didn't know what others wanted. So the, either the children were in conflict or they were disagreeing with the team because nobody really knew what that person wanted. And eight, 60 to 80% of us will lose capacity towards the end of our lives and have somebody else make decisions for us. And so if they don't know what we want, then it becomes very difficult. And the, the path of least resistance is to say, do everything. And so the team then feels distressed or another sibling feels distressed because one sibling is saying, no, we want to keep mom, and, mom on life support or we don't want to not do CPR. And the other one is saying, why are we doing this? This is so inhumane and I'm uh, not, not compassionate at all. And, and so there's this misunderstanding of what, what people want for themselves. And, I've had decision makers say to me, this is the hardest role I've ever had to do is to make a decision on behalf of somebody else. 
or on behalf of my loved ones. So that's a hard, but, so the d advanced directives and, and living wills and powers of attorney for personal care, they're intended to make that person's job easier. It is the gift that you give to your child or your decision maker, your spouse, your partner, whoever it might be that's making that decision. Your gift is to give them the knowledge to make decisions on your behalf to alleviate their burden and their guilt and distress about it. Back to advocacy, how do you deal with somebody who seems to be in their right mind, who does not have the power of attorney, and doesn't really discuss things like this? It's basically their plan is to stay at home until a paramedic comes, they go to the hospital, and they hold the tag home anymore. Yeah. In 2023, yeah. as we just discussed, there's not too many places to go if you can't go home anymore. Yeah, so what you're asking about is somebody who um, still has capacity to understand um, wanting to be at home. Without declaring them incapacitated. Yeah, that's right. Is there anything anybody can do? Yeah, and so, so here's the thing about decision making and for somebody who's capable. So somebody who's capable um, and chooses to live somewhere that's unsafe, um, we have to allow them to do that because we believe in autonomy, right? We believe in being able to make an autonomous decision for ourselves. Where it becomes tricky is where, when it becomes unsafe for that person and that they are, they are now at risk or they're putting somebody else at risk. So then we have to ask ourselves, do they really understand and appreciate those the two tests for capacity, understanding and appreciating the impact of their decision on themselves and on others? And so in some ways it's okay that we may harm ourselves, um, but it's not okay if we harm somebody else. So for example, somebody wants to stay home and your caregiver is your wife who's now put her back out or is now having caregiver burnout and it's impacting others' lives. And so that's when it becomes tricky. I've had clients who have chosen to go the palliative care route before going into hospital. So who have said, like, I'd rather die. And that's a choice, like I'd rather die than have to go into hospital or into long-term care. And that's a reality, and some people really feel strongly about that, that they do not want to. So I don't know if that answered your question. It's a very challenging situation when it comes to capacity assessment and decision-making and doing the right thing for that person that may feel like they know what they want for themselves, but it's very distressing for others around them. And the long-term care home. So, so there's a couple things. So, um, there's the Long-Term Care Act and the, Hos and the Hospitals Act, and then the Healthcare Consent Act. So, those three acts together help make decisions on what happens. So, the acute care centers. So, Joseph Brandt Hospital, Hamilton Health Sciences. Those are all acute care centers that are funded for acute care delivery. When you get to a certain point where you no longer need the services that are being provided at a hospital, you then meet the criteria for discharge. So the physician comes, they write discharge from um, the, the ward because they no longer need any services. Now, that then discharge means, we, like this should happen long before, but we need to plan for where that discharge is gonna be. And sometimes it's not safe for a person to go home. Like let's say they've fallen a couple times or they have early onset dementia and there's a worry about risk of fleeing from that or, or wandering. And so we then start to think, okay, what's, what's a safe discharge location? That person becomes an alternative level of care. Okay, so they become ALC, alternate level of care in the hospital, and the team starts to work with the discharge planners, with our community partners, to try and get you to a place that's safe for you to be. We have this program called Home First. That means the first option is we want to try and get you home. So somebody will come into the home, they'll do an environmental scan, and sometimes we say, well, like the person has to go home and then fail at being at home, come back in, and then we know that they need to go somewhere else. So in that period of time, they're gonna say to you, okay, what's your level of care? If your level of care is you need long-term care, and that's usually when you need two people to help you get out of bed, get into a bath, you can't do your own personal care, you might not be able to pre prepare your meals, that's when you meet long-term care criteria. And they're gonna say, okay, 
we're going to put you on the list for long-term care. While you're waiting for long-term care, they may say, let's send you home. They may say to your daughter, can you take your mom home? I don't know how many people that's happened to before, but can you bring your loved one home with you? Yeah, you're right. They won't put her on the street. That's called abandonment, so we can't do that. Um, so you, so they're going to try and find all different things to get you out of the hospital, out of a hospital bed. They're not going to throw you out on the street, though, okay? Um, but if they come up with a plan that's a safe, good plan to get you somewhere else other than that hospital bed that's no longer funded for you because you're now ALC, then, and you say, no, I don't want to go there. I want to stay right here. They're going to say, okay, but we need to charge you a per diem. Okay, so your per diem starts to kick in once a safe discharge place has been proposed and you've declined it. Okay, so that's the first thing. The next question I think you're asking is uh, the, the Ford Bill, Bill 7, which says, we're gonna, we're gonna send you 60 kilometers away. 70, 70, we're gonna send you 70 kilometers. Maybe it's gonna be 35, maybe it's gonna be 10. But what they're saying is we're gonna send you to the next long-term care facility that pops up in your 70 radius kilometer. You can give us 10 long-term care names um, on the list, or by law, you actually only have to give one, so don't let anyone tell you you need to put however many, one, like two, three, four, five. You can put the number on there, but you, by law, only have to put one home. But now with the new Doug Ford, that one home has to be on a short list, and a short list means it's a high turnover for that home. Guess what? The, where those homes often are? Yeah, yeah, right, right. They're the crummiest of the crummiest. That's why there's a high turnover, right? It's just like you know, you can get into a, you know, let's just. I'm not going to pick on hairdressers, but maybe there's like this like supremo, you know, Hollywood hairdresser that you know has a wait list of a hundred, and then there's somebody who you know is a hardworking person that works at Superplex and their weakness is short, right? So you get the point, right? So so that shortness, you have to have one home that's at least on the shortness. So if you put one home on your list, you, you have to have it on the shortness. You put two, your ideal one, and then your shortness. Or you may want to put four because you don't want to get on the shortlist. If that shortness home comes up, and they're gonna ask you, do you want to go to this home? If, they, if you say no, and it's the, the Ford law is implemented, Bill 7 is implemented, that says, I'm sorry, but yes, we're going to have to transfer you there with or without consent, and then we'll transfer you to that home. So that's the whole um, kind of, in a nutshell, wait list and how that all works. I've worked with clients who, you know, I said, because this same thing happened to one of my clients, and I suggested that they call the ethics department and to help them navigate through the conflict. Guess what happened? No. <laughs> she didn't get sent, she got to her first place home. I don't know how that happens. But sometimes it's asking the right question at the right time to the right person. Well, it is being the squeaky wheel, and the, I, have a, I do have issues when we listen to the squeaky wheel because then it's disadvantaging the person that doesn't have the voice. And I'm all about the vulnerable person. And so I try and help people be the squeaky wheel, I guess, who's more vulnerable. So. Yes. Who pays you? Who pays me? Yes. Like, I mean, if I call you, yes. Yeah. So, so I have a private practice. It's much cheaper to go through my private practice than it is the law firm. Um, but yeah, so I do have a private practice that I have to leave all my cards, um, and then and then that. And then you know we do have some hospital navigators as well, but um, they're very specific to to focusing on discharge. So. Yeah, yeah, but that's, yeah, I, I have a private practice and that's how I get paid, yeah. Sorry. I have, a, I have a question for you, Sandra. So, Alyssa said that if, um, in long-term care, if you're on, you've got a bunch of the, the options on the list and they give you a spot in one that you really don't want, so you go there, yeah. and then you're able to move later. What is the likelihood of being here? Yeah, so I can talk about that. So I think that's important to understand the whole triage in Ontario. And those of that have to leave, please feel free to leave. Um, and yeah, I, mean, I don't want anyone to feel like they have to stay. Um, but I, I'll just talk about triage lists in Ontario. So we think about this idea of triage, even for like knee replacements, for waiting for, for um, uh, a long-term care bed. But the reality is, 
it's 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 not a wait list, it's a triage acuity list. So if you are acute, if you are in hospital and you need to go to a long-term care bed, then you will be bumped up on the list because one, they need to get you out of the hospital, so you're automatically um, being um, um, uh, triaged higher up. If you have a spouse that's in a long-term care facility, you are gonna be first on the list for that long-term facility to repatriate the two of you. Um, so, so it's really about how acute are your needs at this moment. I had a client where you know, her, she couldn't manage her husband any longer and um, they, they wanted her to transfer him to another assisted living facility with more care, which meant more money for her. Like a, a tremendous amount of money for that, for that um, couple. And so what, what ended up happening is they stayed in their home, which meant he continued to go up and up on the list and he ended up into a long-term care facility. So this idea of triaging, you know, we think about for hip replacement, knee replacement. If you are getting really, really unwell on that list, you're gonna be bumped up to the top of the list. So to answer your question, if you're in a facility that's looking after you and you're in a bed, you are gonna be put at the bottom of the list. Okay, and this is part of the problem with this board bill, and this is what people were concerned about, that if I end up there, what's the chance of me actually getting to my number one place. You can continue to be on the list, and you know eventually they'll get to the people that have been waiting on the list for a long time. Um, but there is more. The, the person that's most acute is going to be the person that's going to get that bed first. Thanks very much, Sandra, Alyssa, Jerry. We're here to just back everybody up. Thank you so much. Hope you found today's session helpful, valuable. Uh, just going to ask. I know everyone's anxious to get going. Um, one of my slides, I haven't got it up there, but it's always plan ahead. So all of us here, our goal is to help everyone avoid a crisis. So it's really about being prepared and, and planning. Uh, you've got some uh, evaluation forms. Please do fill those out because they're valuable. We do make decisions based on that. And register for the next session, which is on February the 14th.